Notice that it's a very clearly defined response. Wait 10 days, measure the height of the plot. There's no ambiguity. That's a very simple experiment, but most of you will get stuck on this one. You don't have to measure the height, you might also measure some other things. For example, you might measure the width of the leaves, or the length to width aspect ratio. That's an outcome there. You might choose to measure the leaf's color. Special instruments are available these days to quantify color for us, so you can measure the leaf's color. You might measure the stem diameter on the plant at a particular point. So stem diameter is just above the soil. Very specific, very clearly defined response variable. If you're measuring sales in store, the total profit might be one quantity, but it doesn't need to be just total profit. It might be number of units sold, which is going to be correlated to profit. But you can see here how your choice of response is very important. Going into your experiment, you must have a good idea what your response or responses are. And most times you will have multiple responses. You won't just have a single outcome. In fact, if you're doing your experiment, you pretty well should think of as many responses as you possibly can, measure them all, so that when you do your experiments, you get all your data in one go. If you have to go back and redo all your experiments because you forgot an important response, you've just doubled your budget. Just wasted half your budget on experiments that are not likely of much value. So coming into your experiment with a clearly defined idea of what your response is is critical. Any questions on this so far? Yes. Okay, the ranked response. So the one, two, three, four, five. Okay. This is a good point. Let's think of this. Responses are almost always continuous in some way. Okay. So your response could be a continuous variable, but you're oftentimes you see this often in surveys. One is poor, two, three, four, five is high in some way. Okay. Those are still valid response variables. So almost always your response will be continuous. However, it doesn't need to be.
no, no. So what I'm saying is here, you're going to first you're going to identify that pH is your factor. The second goal that you have to do is choose what the low level and the high level is. It's, right, so in one set of experiments, low might be four and high might be five. In a different context, in a different case study, low might be 11 and high might be 12. But the key is you're picking two levels to run your experiment at that are relevant to your case. This is also the part that people often struggle with the most, is figuring out what levels to pick. Okay, so I'll give some guidance in a minute. If you're dealing with categorical variables, they're far easier to figure out what's low and high. Categorical variables, low might be catalyst A and B might be catalyst, uh, sorry, catalyst B will be your high level. So your variable is catalyst, and low will be catalyst A, your high level will, come, will correspond to using catalyst B. This will be a factor. If your factor here, for example, is the mixer, using mixer A will be low and mixer B could be considered high. If one of your factors is the operator's name, the operator, there might be operator Paul, and there might be operator Sue. It doesn't matter which one you put. You put one name in the low level and put the other name in the high level. So when it comes to categorical variables, switching what's low and high around is acceptable. It just happens to be what your choice is. And there's no, there's nothing negative and positive associated with being low and high. It's simply just a designation. So this is a split important point. For categorical variables, it doesn't really matter which is low and high. For continuous variables, we will almost always set low to be the smaller numerical quantity and the high to be the larger numerical quantity. And you'll see why that's appropriate uh, in many times. Okay, so we've gone ahead and done that. Let's take a look at an example here. And we go back to this example where we're considering substrate concentration. I'm going to give that a shorthand name S. So my vertical axis here I'm going to call S. And my horizontal axis is temperature, T. So we're considering the effect of two factors, S and T, on the yield that we get from my bioreactor. So T and S. Now, what do we pick for low temperature and high temperature? Well, here I've got low temperature at about 300 and some odd degrees, 339, I think it is. Let me tell the next slide. 338. So I put low temperature at 338 Kelvin and high temperature at 353. And I've chosen substrate concentration to be at 1.25 and 1.75 respectively. Okay, how did I pick those particular levels for low and high? Well, in this case it was easy because historically we've been always operating our process at that baseline. That's where we operate our process day in and day out. So we've got a lot of data around that point already. Choose low to be a step down from that baseline, and you choose high to be a step up from the baseline. Well, how far do you step? Consider this lower bound the minimum temperature that you can possibly run the reactor at. You can never run the reactor lower than 320 Kelvin. There might be a safety reason for it or an operational reason. Pretty much any variable of practical use in an experiment, you can almost always identify suitable lower and upper bounds. So here, you cannot go below 320, you cannot go above 380 Kelvin. But that's not where you put your low. <coughs> Don't run your lowest temperature at 320 and do not run your high temperature at 380. Because you're going to see from this work we're going to do our next goal after analyzing the data, is we're going to move the set of experiments into the direction that's increasing. So 
So if you've got to place your experiments at these four corners of the graph, you can't move anywhere. You're already at your extremes. So we always place our experimental points in the interior of our range. And well, how far should this range stand? A good rule of thumb is about 25 to 30, maybe even 40 percent. But sit start conservatively and let that distance over there horizontally correspond to, correspond to about 25 percent of the total range of there. If you've got absolutely no idea where to place those experiments, that's an okay point to start at. And here vertically, use a range that spans about 25 to 30 percent of the total range of Yes. So when you said you drop the drop off, you have no idea what to start from. So what is the scenario where you have an idea of what to start from? You come into a chemical plant and they give you this batch reactor at that temperature and that concentration for months or years. That's your starting point. You know that you can't go below 320, but the operators will tell you typically a 5, 10 degree jump is okay, is a reasonable deviation. Okay? You're unlikely to blow up the place when you drop to low temperatures or cause safety issues if you go to too high temperatures. So you're taking a reasonable step that the equipment and the operators are going to be comfortable doing the experiments with. Nine times out of ten, you're going to give this work to someone else to do. If they're not comfortable running this experiment, you've chosen settings that are inappropriate. You should probably back down and come in for the course. Okay, so this is why I want you to do and pay attention to your DOE project. You're going to have to decide those ranges and where you run your experiments yourself. And that's a challenge for you the first time you do this. You can practice at it. So doing this project is a good way to So we've identified our factors, temperature and substrate, and we've identified our levels that we're going to operate at, at those four levels. And what you notice there is I've already hinted at how the experiment is set up, in fact. I've already hinted and shown you that cubic shape on the, on the plot. And there's a reason why it's that shape. And we're going to attach some notation to it. So this is something we're going to see frequently. Let's get comfortable with this. We're going to write up this table. How did I write up this table? Well, it's very simple for two factors, temperature and substrate. And when we get to three factors, four factors, this table gets a lot more messy. But there's a system behind it. So let's figure out what the system is. The first thing to recognize is how many experiments you're going to run. You're always going to run two to the K. K is equal to your number of factors. You have three factors, you're going to run eight experiments. Four factors you've identified, you're going to run 16 experiments. Well, how do you decide what those 16 experiments are if you have four factors? That's, you can go through all the combinations in your head, but there's a very simple way you can quickly find all the possible combinations. Let's take a look at the simple case that we've all done today. What we do is, build up a table that's called the standard order. And the standard order says enumerate your factors along the columns starting with any particular one. So we'll start with temperature as my first factor. And I'll choose my next factor, which is substrate. If you have three factors, you have a third column, four factors, and fourth column, and so on. So the rule, are, the rule is start all your experiments with all the um, settings of the variables at their lowest level. So low and low. That's the first, first entry in standard order is always low and low. The next one is you vary the level of the first factor. So vary the level of the first factor, that's low, then high. Vary the level then, and sorry, and keep the other factors constant. So in this case, S is kept constant. So the first column changes the fastest. It goes low and then high. And then you simply repeat that first column again, low and 
high. And we know we only stop at 4 because we know that k is equal to 2. So in this case, 2 to the 2 is equal to 4. I know that I only need 4 rows. So here in the first column, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, until you get exactly the number of rows you require. The second column varies at a slower rate to the previous column. So I've got low, low here already, then the next two are high, high. That's how standard order is developed. First column varies the most rapidly, second column varies at a slower rate, at half the rate of the first column. If we had a third column, it would vary at half the rate of the prior column. We'll, we'll see plenty of examples with three factors and four factors coming up. So for two factors, we always have this very simple table developing. I'm going to replace these lows and highs with pluses and minuses. This is a standard feature we'll do, so it's minus, plus, minus, plus, and S is minus, minus, plus, plus. It will replace our lows and highs with minus ones and plus ones. There's a good reason for that as well. And that's standard order. There are your four experiments that you go around. Experiment one, two, three, and four. But the key thing is you never, ever run your experiments in the order of that table. At your desk, on your spreadsheet, you set it up this way, but when you give this experiment over to the operator, you never give it to him or her in this order. You go to a random number generator, or use cards, or piece of paper, whatever it takes to get a random sequence of numbers, and you re reorder the table in a random fashion. So just shuffle all your rows around there. And that's it. Then you go ahead and do your experiments. So generating this takes four or five minutes. Doing the work can take days. And once you go and do the work, or the operator goes and does work, you come back and you assemble the data. So let's assemble the data now. In this particular example, if we ran these experiments, I'm measuring the yield of my process. The yield will call Y. And we get here in standard order 69% yield, 60, 64, and then 53%. That's simply our response. Why is my response? And in this case, my response is here. There's a note here that it's wasteful to do an experiment at the baseline. There's no need to go to the middle point and do an experiment. So if you wanted to, that's quite okay. And I often recommend to people, if this is the first time you're doing an experiment on the system, go do an experiment at the moment. Because if you waste it, you waste it. But it's still kind of, if, you, if it's a successful experiment, you can still use the data. But if you waste it, it's not a data. And the red point is simply halfway along the distance from the lower to the it's it's exactly halfway through. You don't. So just we typically will only use the points. If you do a bit points, you can do it, and I'll show you some examples later. But for now, we don't we don't run a baseline. Okay. So let's take a look at how we analyze this data. Before we even go ahead and analyze it. This is why I like the DOE topic. It appeals to people who like to look at things analytically. It appeals to people who like things geometrically. There's our four results. And notice that we achieved a yield here, for example, of 60. 60 was the yield when we were operating at high temperature, so 354 Kelvin. So that plus there refers to high temperature, 354 Kelvin. And the minus over here, for substrate concentration refers to this minus over here, 1.25. So 60% yield at 1.25 grams per liter of X, and temperature is held at 3.4. If you take a look at those examples, uh, sorry, those four numbers, where would you run your next experiment?
Experiment number five. Point in the general direction where you're going to run your next experiment. Okay, down the left. Very, very intuitive. There's no second guessing this. Your direction of optimality is somewhere down in this, this region. That's where your next experiment is going to run. Okay, because that's the direction that improves your yield the most. So if you go super close those four data points, let's go back here to this graph. We've operated at those four points over there. We're saying our next experiment somewhere over here. We don't know yet how far. Two weeks from now, I'm going to show you how to take the, the leap to this point over here. By how much you should jump and what to do once you've jumped. But for now, what you've got to have in mind is imagine you're blind and you've got a cane in your hand and you're tapping the ground around you. So you're putting your cane down four times in the region around you and you're using those four data points to figure out the direction that's the steepest. Okay, so with that idea in mind, you're going to see that coming up in two weeks from now. You're going to head up in that direction. Mm -hmm. But let's figure out what we're going to do right now. Well, right now is we want to tell what is what is the area around us look like. How do we quantify that? And this is where the DOE part begins. And it's all done by hand. And it's very straightforward. Let me show you how we develop this. This is where you're going to end up with. So let's work at this together. And then I'm going to give you a different case study that you can try it out a second time. So my experiments are complete. And I get these four numbers, 64, 53, 69, and 60. And this horizontal distance here, that's the effect of temperature. And this is temperature low, and this is temperature high. These vertical distances represent the effect of substrate. So that vertical change is the effect of S substrate and it's the effect from low substrate to high substrate. So if we increase temperature, what's going to happen to yield? It's going to drop. If we increase substrate, what's going to happen to yield? Increase substrate, it decreases. Yield decreases. So we should see that in our results when we quantify this numerical. So let's, how do we quantify it? Here's how we do it, and we always follow the same systematic approach. Let's start with the effect of temperature. So we agree. So the effect of T and we do it twice. We calculate the effect of temperature two times, one at low S, sorry, one at high S and one at low S. So at IS, the effect of temperature is as follows. We always subtract high from low. Notice if it's the difference is from high to low. Take a look at the, on the slide where that is. At high S, we're at 53 and going to low temperature. So we keep S constant, we're very low in temperature. We're going 53 up to 64. So the effect of that is from high to low. So at high S, we can say 53 minus 64, and that's equal to minus 11. If we're at low substrate concentration, the effect of, of changing temperature is to go from 60 up to 69. We've gone from 60 to 69, and that's a minus 9 in the drop.
This is a little counterintuitive, but we're going to see where this, why this is this way in a minute. So what we do next is we say, we've got two estimates now of changing temperature. If S is high, our temperature effect is minus 11. If S is low, our temperature effect is minus 9. So let's simply average that, and we call that our temperature effect is minus 10% yield per 16 Kelvin change. Minus 10 is halfway between minus 11 and minus 9. So on average, my yield will drop by 10% if I increase temperature by 16 Kelvin. So notice that 16 Kelvin comes from the fact that low temperature was 338, high temperature was 334. So we get exactly what we expected. As temperature increases, you all told me that yield drops. And you see that. Yield is going to decrease by 10% on average should we increase the temperature by 16 Kelvin. And for now, you can just take this as, as a sort of a way to do it. You'll see the justification for it in two classes from now. But we will typically report those values on half the different spaces. So in other words, we will say that this is a minus 5% yield per 8 Kelvin change. What do I mean by that? Well, take a look here. This distance over here represents a 16 Kelvin change. So if I have to make a 8 Kelvin change, it simply says I'm simply not going to Way, I'm only going half the way. That's an 8 Kelvin change. Well, an 8 Kelvin change will simply drop my yield by half the full distance. So instead of a 10% drop, it's only going to drop to 5 There's a reason for that division by 2. Okay, everyone comfortable with the effects of changing temperature keeping substrate constant? Okay, now we can repeat the same analogy won't go through it, but the idea is the same. Keeping temperature fixed, we can find the effect of substrate. So we call this the main effect. The main effect up here of substrate concentration can be found by looking at these vertical distances. So this time I'm considering these vertical distances because that's the distance, that's the direction substrate is changing. We look at 53 minus 60 over here, that's at high temperature. We look at 64 minus 69 difference at low temperature. Calculate the average of that is minus 6% decrease in yield for every half a gram per liter change in substrate concentration. We simply report that divided by 2. Now, this slide. Is, a, is an interesting one. I'm revealing to you what the true system is. In practice, we don't know the surface exists. What I want to show you is how the results that we've acquired so far match up with the surface. So one thing you might like to do is in your plots on your slides, label this point that's closest to you. That is point number one in the standard order table. That was the point where we got 69% yield it's at low temperature, 338, and at low S, 125. So this top peak over here is the first experiment from the standard oil table. That point way far back in the page, over there in the bottom, that was the point we acquired at high temperature and at high substrate concentration. That was a yield of 50 back way back over there. So high temperature, high substrate concentration. That's point number four from the second tip. The closest to is point number one, furthest back is point number four. Over here, what is this point at this scale? So low temperature. 
temperature, high substrate concentrations experiment number three on the left, and this one over here on the right is experiment number two. So you can orient yourself in a 3D world, taking this table over here, 69, 60, 64, 53, and that's what we require. We don't actually know that the surface has this shape. Right? All that we've done is we simply got the four corner points, but I'm showing you what the truth is in between the four points. So let's interpret our experimental results in this context. The effective temperature we said was from the gear at 10% carbon yield per 16 Kelvin change. So what it says is that if we increase temperature by 16 Kelvin, we're going to see on average a 10% drop in yield. And notice here, we actually acquire that data twice. We've acquired this data once at the front face of the cube, and we've acquired it a second time at the back face of the cube, and we've recorded the average. The front face of the cube will drop by minus 9, and the back face of the cube will drop by minus 11. So on average, we say that the slope decline is at the 10% rate from the standard. We say also that the effect of substrate concentration, if we increase substrate concentration, that yield will drop. And that's, that's the data we're recording on these sides. Then one final way to visualize this, I showed this to you right at the start of the course when we looked at visualization. A really interesting way of interpreting this is simply to plot the slope curves, where you plot the effective temperature with the two lines, the black line and the blue line. One represents the effect of high substrates, the other represents the effect of low substrates. Similarly, here with the black and the blue lines, one is keeping temperature at the high level, the other line is keeping temperature at the low level. And the fact that the lines are approximately parallel has an interesting interpretation. We'll use the new, another term saying that there's no interaction between these variables. If these lines are perfectly parallel, we say there's no interaction. Very minimal extra. So this is the key in 
aside from DOEs. Because changing your variable simultaneously gets you that efficient data acquisition. Okay, so let me give you a chance to consider the following system. I'm going to move that square to a different part of the process. I moved it to these temperatures and these substrate concentrations. It's a totally different location on the plot. And I've acquired four data points. Now, here's what I want you to notice. Previously, we were operating way up here, and we had a pretty smooth surface to work with. operating over here. So there's a pretty smooth surface that's increasing it in this direction. I have now moved you onto a ridge. Okay, I'm looking at a very different system, but I've essentially placed you on a ridge. Now it's not so nicely shaped anymore. I want you to calculate what the effect of temperature is and what the effect of substrate is in exactly the same way we just did together here. Here's the table. at low temperature, high temperature, low substrate, high substrate. This should take you about five minutes the first time you do this. A week from now, this should take you one minute to two minutes to do this. Now, the main effect of T, now, the main effect of S. And there's no point in looking at the answers on the next slide. <laughs>
first step is always to draw the cube part. That's got to be absolutely the first step in every case. Make sure you can replicate those values and then next part we'll do some interpretation solutions. 